Hello? Sunmay, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud. Ah, okay, <laughs> good. And uh, can you switch on the video? Sure. Okay, good. Very good. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Very nice. So you can see uh, Dr. Somo Jati Biswas, my colleague is here. Hello. Hi. <laughs> And uh, we have around 25 participants till now. Okay, let's uh, maybe wait for five minutes. We can start at two five in the meantime. So it's 5.30 now, right? Right. right it's 5.30. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit late on Saturday, but... Why? 5.30? <laughs> on Saturday, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you know, it's... Okay. It's all. So how is life there? Life in general is good. Like everything is open here. It's just nobody can come into Japan. Mm. If I go out, it's impossible to get in Japan. So I was very lucky that in October they opened a little window where they reduced the travel restrictions and I could go back home. But again, due to the Omicron hoax <laughs> or whatever you call, uh, it's pretty strict. Even there, there was a two weeks window when uh, the government was not allowing even the Japanese to come back. Then there was a case in the court, etc. So now Japanese can come, but it's pretty strict. Mm. Like. Even if you can come like two weeks mandatory quarantine in the government designated quarantine facilities near the airport, you can't avoid that. So, and this is for uh, sort of indefinite period. This whole yeah uh, yeah. This, so they haven't said anything. No, I mean, but Christmas uh, is coming. There might be too much activity in Tokyo. So all are closed, or they are doing something. No, here. Everything is open. It's that you can't come into Japan. If you are in Japan, enjoy everything. So there is no no restriction on celebrations. Everything okay. That's good actually. All the shops are open. All the public transports are open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so good. Actually, in July, no, in June when I first time came to Japan, it was quite a bit hectic. I had like to get the travel permission. Mm -hmm. they, they follow a lot of paperwork, actually. Uh, but uh, it's not like that, I, at least my experience. I mean, there are designated people like the secretaries and those people. They yeah, will yeah. help you a lot. <laughs> but uh, yeah, otherwise are... you can't do anything. I mean, this language yeah. is a huge barrier. You can't even fill up any form without. Google Translate do not work. Yeah. Or not satisfactorily, at least. <laughs> anyway, my last six years were always in non English speaking countries. So I learned how to live in a hand share, hand wavy language. <laughs> how, how much you have learned Japanese? Zero. I mean, it's only Konichiwa and Arigato Gozaimas. So these two things. And... That's starting and the ending. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and some hello. Now, what is that word? Uh, goodbye. I also forgot that word. Anyway, uh, I said to once Mihoko, and everybody was laughing at me. Maybe it was too, too early to say that. <laughs> but initially, I learned that word, so I applied right away. Yes. <laughs> you retained your originality everywhere. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but as Japanese are, so they will politely uh, acknowledge your mistake. <laughs> no, yeah. Nothing uh, sort of in what they will exchange. Yeah, so yeah, right, mm. especially after Israel, uh, mm. I think Japan is ultra polite. Yeah, the two completely different, right? The people, Absolutely. Japan is different. Almost wins. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, in Israel, people will be like extremely extrovert, sometimes vulgar, 
but here it's just completely opposite absolute opposite yeah it's very hard even they have uh, got angry on you i mean that also is not visible from their expression forget about they will not exchange words that anyway <laughs> but even from their facial expressions it's also difficult and you are seeing this and everything is recorded on live i don't know i hope <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's live in YouTube. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. So maybe we can. You know, I will just try to share my keynote and try to see if the full screen, the slide changing, and the mouse, etc., are working. So. So I'm I'm relogging. Okay, I had to make some. Uh, sorry, I mean there is a power interruption. Uh, am I audible? Hello. Yes, sir. Audible, sir. Uh, okay. And uh, Dr. Sanmay, uh, are you there? Not there, sir. Sir. He was here moments ago. Oh no, he is now reconnecting. Uh, okay. Actually, there is a power cut. So I mean, do you hear me now? Uh, you are muted. Uh, Right. So, do you hear me? Yeah. 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 That's right. Sorry for the interruption. So, let's just maybe start because. Okay. So, uh, shall we start? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, I can't see your. Yeah. Now I can see your slides. Yes. Okay. Great. I can see your slide. You can maybe make it full screen now. Yeah. Can you yeah. see it's changing? I can see it's changing, yes. And can you see the mouse? I can see the mouse. Okay, fantastic. So I'm ready for my slide. Okay, good. Okay, uh, then uh, welcome back to the uh, second half of this one day symposium on applications of uh, machine learning in physics. And uh, now the speaker is uh, Dr. Shanmoy Ganguly, who did his PhD in uh, TIFR Mumbai, and then postdoc in CNRS uh, in France first, and then in Weizmann Institute in Israel. Uh, in both of these cases, he uh, worked with the uh, Atlas, Ex Atlas experiment. So he's a particle physics experimentalist. Uh, he's presently now an assist uh, assistant professor in the University of Tokyo. And uh, he will be talking about the deep relation between particle physics and machine learning. So, uh, Dr. Ganguly, okay. please. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Biswas. So, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to get this opportunity to talk to you, uh, the distinguished uh, faculty members of SRM University, and all the other ones who have joined this session. Hopefully sometime in future, I can go to your university uh, to just interact you, with you in person. Um, but until then, let's stick to Zoom. I especially want to thank Dr. Amit Chakraborty, who is a good friend of mine for inviting me. So it's, it's a happy moment. Uh, and uh, in the morning session, you heard a lot about the core aspects of machine learning where there was a great amount of discussion on explainability of AI, followed by all the discussions of generative model, et cetera. And the second session is on <clears throat> application of machine learning in different branches of natural science. My field of expertise is particle physics. And uh, for last say four years, I have been working on application of machine learning in particle physics. 
So I want to share with you some of uh, the things brewing in the subject uh, of particle physics and machine learning interface and uh, what gives us the excitement. So this is all this talk is about. Okay. And uh, since you heard that my background is experimental particle physics, let's say lion's share of this talk will be about connection between the experimental aspects, especially what happening at LHC and it's uh, and the application of machine learning in LHC physics, the Large Hadron Collider at Sun. But nonetheless, this list is not exhaustive. And if I have to cover uh, all the activities going on in the broad particle physics community with machine learning, I have to give four or five talks. Okay, so uh, surely I can't cover everything. I have picked up some topics uh, which are uh, close to my heart, let's say, but nonetheless, I will try to highlight, apart from the LHC physics, what other branches of particle physics are using machine learning as well. So let's see. Now, uh, since it's a machine learning symposium and uh, all of you have joined, uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, most of you have somewhat familiarity with machine learning aspects. So this talk is not going to about uh, what are the basic machine learning is and what is back propagation, et cetera. I will assume everyone has some level of familiarity, but nonetheless, I don't expect many of you to be familiar with particle physics. So I will introduce a little bit about what's the core science we are trying to do, because in any machine learning application, it's important to understand what's the data and what's the task we are going to solve using neural networks. So in this case, the data is all about particle physics. So I want to explain in the initial part of the talk, what core science we are trying to do, and then we'll gradually migrate to the application of machine learning in that particular branch of science. So let's start. So who are we? the particle physicists, we are actually not new species. You know, from ancient time, uh, human beings have asked themselves what everything is made of. And broadly, that's the legacy grand question which we are still following. So from 400 BCE, there were concepts in ancient Egyptian, Greek, and Indian civilization that Everything is made out of few elements like fire, earth, water, air, etc. Come down almost like 2000 years ahead. In the early part of 19th, 19th century, there was Dalton's atomic theory, which told us that atoms are invisible. That turned out to be not the case, even 100 years down the line, around early part of 20th century when Bohr's model of atom came and we knew that there is a nucleus, there are electrons, the, the electrons jump around different energy states, emit energies. And by the mid of 20th century, it was clear that even the fundamental particles sitting inside the nucleus, protons, neutrons, they also have inner structures. They are made out of quarks and gluons. So it's remarkable that as the technology went ahead, we could come up with uh, machinery to probe deeper into the heart of matter. We really could unfill new structures, new interaction of matter. And current day particle physicists are concerned with the same old question, what is the fundamental constituents of matter, how they build up the whole universe, how they interact with themselves. And to do that, the state of the art modern machine is the one sitting in the border of France and Switzerland, and it's called Large Hadron Collider. It's a 27 kilometer circumference machine, which has four, gen uh, four main, let's say, detectors, and the two general purpose detectors, which are named CMS and ATLAS, sits just diametrically opposite to each other. They try to do all kind of uh, physics, which uh, normally can be done. Let's say modulo neutrino physics. Okay, and the other one has specializations. So it's a huge 
experimental facility. And here to show you how big they are, the general purpose detectors, that you can see this is a full grown human being. It's a real life picture and compared to them, how big the machines are. They're tremendously large. And uh, what happens here that in this tunnel, uh, people's like the facility is to accelerate protons. And when the protons reach a huge amount of velocity, like 99% the speed of light, they are made to crash on each other head to head. That collision, the crash uh, head to head just breaks the proton up. And we try to study what is coming out of that interaction. And that's what this experimental setup is all about. So here you can see a picture that uh, this is an instance that few protons banged on each other and the energy is coming out of this uh, collision process. So the picture you see here, all this yellowish tower, there are actually devices to capture energy. They are called calorimeters. So the amount of energy it will receive that will be stored in the calorimeter. And also in the central part, there is a huge amount of magnetic field in which all the charged particles bend. And uh, we measure the curvature of such bending process to identify what the particles are. Okay, so this is the kind of physics we are trying to, this is the experimental process we have built up. Now, what elementary physics this ele experimental process tries to teach us? So let's go to a bit detail in the schematic process to give you some overall broad picture. We do a proton-proton collision I told you that protons are not elementary. They're built out of tiny little other objects called quarks and gluons. They undergo collision with each other. And some, at some later time, there are a bunch of heavier particles called hadrons. They are built of pions, kaons, et cetera, alongside with photons, some electrons, muons, et cetera, all come out, which is uh, a late, st late time uh, state of this proton-proton collision. And in all these fancy machines, we catch these particles. And what we try to study from the energy and momentum of these particles, we try to study what kind of interaction went here. Okay, so let's see a step-by-step -step cartoon process of what happens. So let's think there was a collision. If you don't understand this diagram, it's fine. This is called a Feynman diagram. You didn't know this. But you can think of two particles collided and few things are coming out. And these particles decay to form uh, a bunch of hadrons, what I told you. Now, these hadrons are the ones which enter inside our detector. Okay. So if we have a detector, these are the particles which enter inside our detector and put their energy inside detector. What we measure is these energies. Now, what do we do with this? We have a measurement of energy. So we have a differential cross-section measurement. So this is just like Rutherford scattering experiment, what we learn in quantum mechanics. And from this measurement, we try to guess what could be the possible interaction at the tiniest length scale? We want to guess the parameters of Lagrangian. Okay, so that's the grand program we try to do uh, through all these measurements and analysis. So that's the whole story, what particle physicists, especially the experimental particle physicists try to do. And now the question comes, can we solve this kind of inverse problem through machine learning? But if we ask this question, it also becomes important to address why at all we need machine learning. Weren't people doing the same story until now? So now we will see that with passage of time, why it's becoming more and more important to have machine learning in this whole story. So LHC is really a big data business. And when you hear about 
machine learning, you hear that, okay, AI and big data, as if these two words go synonymous with each other. I want to convince you that LHC experiments are really factory of big data. Why? In, in reality, per second, there are trillions of protons colliding with each other. And this is not a word for uh, just expressing a large number. It's practically more than a trillion of protons colliding with each other. And if you want to store the whole data, which we can get out of this trillion proton collisions, that will be 60 million MB data per second, which is impossible to store. We don't have such large storage amounts. So first we need to reduce size. And this size reduction is done through multi-stage filters, which are called triggers. And you can see that how much the data reduction happens. So from this huge chunk of 60 million MB data per second, first stage, we have 100,000 per second. That is further reduced to 40,000 per second. And finally, the data which we try to analyze, that has a rate of 1,000 per second. So even after filtering, it's a quite huge chunk of data which we need to analyze. And also during this process of filtering out, we need to have a right decision-making to filter out such data. So this is really a big, big data crunching game, which we need to do consistently in order to do quality physics. So these numbers are flashed to just show you that LHC experiments really deal with large amount of data and possibly application of machine learning can help us. Okay, so let's see how it can be. Before the wave of machine learning started, this concept was anticipated. And already in 2014, you can see there were machine learning challenges, just like identical to Kaggle challenges, what we have in the current day, they were coming up in the high energy community. So why that was? Because we are looking for some interesting physics, which is hiding under a huge amount of known physics. So we really need to filter out that one precious instance where we can find the kind of interaction we are looking for. And for this, a very high quality of data analysis is inevitable. And that's what we are trying to do using machine learning. Okay, so here is a diagram that uh, a large splash of energy coming out of proton-proton collision. And this is happening every time a proton is banging with another proton. And then, as I told you, trillions of protons are colliding with each other. And then probably we are looking for physics, which will happen once every millionth of a collision event. So this is really a very hard task. And that's why we are migrating towards machine learning eventually. Okay, but just to tell you that uh, the friendship between neural networks and high energy community is not new. Uh, if you keep a track of uh, the particle physics world, you must have heard about top quarks, which were discovered in 1994. And even that uh, time during the discovery, a very high quality of boosted decision tree analysis was used to discover top quarks. So BDTs are uh, machine learning in some sense, and uh, they were used in the early part of 1990s. And even in the context of high energy physics, people in like uh, in the last decade already talked about using of machine learning for high energy physics analysis. So just to show you that uh, this is going on for quite some time. And is this uh, old friendship rather uh, not so old friendship is growing? I would say pretty much. Uh, I just wanted to show you this uh, letter like CERN Courier is the monthly newsletter which comes out of CERN. So that really tries to highlight 
all the happening things are uh, going on at CERN. And this is an issue from the September, October monthly newsletter. And the cover page is all about artificial intelligence. So you can see how modern and uh, like important machine learning is for the high energy community. This is just to show you. Okay, so now I will, uh, by the way, if you have any question, you can ask me during the talk. Okay, no problem for that. So now I, uh, with this introduction, I will try to discuss with you how machine learning and high energy physics talk to each other, uh, given that it's really important to use machine learning in high energy physics. So let's try to remind you, this was the picture on the bottom right, I showed you that how the energy patterns look like in the detector uh, when uh, there is a collision. What these energy patterns are, this is practically how an energetic particle deposit energy inside a detector when it passes through the detector. This is the core mechanism of particle detection. That is by capturing the energy deposition pattern. And this is a schematic diagram that here it shows through this red arrow, a particle is passing through material blocks and there are multi-layered material blocks and how it's depositing energy. Okay, now you, you can think this of as a grid data pattern and the amount of energy deposits as intensity of pixels. So if you just change the language of energy deposit to pixel intensity, you can easily see that this energy deposition pattern can be easily repressed, uh, expressed as images. And this concept really brought the revolution in the world of particle physics as far as machine learning applications are concerned. And people just realized at the very next stage since we have a detector with well-defined location of this energy capturing cells, this energy deposition pattern can be represented as a point cloud. So similar to say for an analogy, facial identification, where you can give the picture of an image and ask a neural network to identify the image. You can also represent the face of a human being as a 3D point cloud with some certain connections to form a graph and uh, do a graph neural network analysis. The exact same technique can be applied to energy deposition patterns of uh, energetic particle traveling through a medium. And we can use exact same neural network architecture to study the property of this data. And this kind of applications became very popular and became the mainstream replacing the older methods. And I will give you a detailed uh, description of in which way these neural network methods are used. Okay, so just to give you a short intermediate summary that from last 15 minutes of discussion, probably it's pretty evident that we, the particle physicists, use machine learning day in, day out, almost in all branches of particle physics. So first, to highlight what are the major activities in an experimental particle physics. So that's something called triggering, the data reduction scheme I told you. Then there are additional junk of a collision which is happening and some unwanted amount of energy which is present. That's called pileup. So we need to remove that. We need to really identify what kind of particles coming out. That's called object identification. And there are tons of other activities which are well defined within the framework of particle physics. Okay, so this is what I have plotted in Y axis. And then let's look into modern machine learning methods the classification, the regression, the unsupervised learning, the generative models, optimal transport. And each of this method comes with individual data representation like images, point clouds, graphs, grids, tree sets, etc. And 
when you make this grand combination, you can ask what are the all possible combination in which there is a tick mark in the sense which machine learning method is applied to which subtask of particle physics, you will see this handshake matrix is getting filled up very fast. And most of the boxes in this matrix have a tick by now. And I'm sure in next five years, all the boxes will be ticked out. People will try every possible thing and uh, eventually will come up with a decision that in the long run, what are the methods are most suitable for particle physicists? Okay, so this is a very active growing area and very exciting. Like people like me are trying to learn everything we can from the machine learning community and trying to apply. Similarly, particle physicists are writing papers and publishing them in new IPS or ICLR kind of conference. So this is really a brewing area. And uh, let's, let me share some of this excitement with you. Okay, so uh, given this, now onwards, I will dive a bit deeper into the individual tasks and try to tell you how machine learning is used. So let me try to remind you this picture again, where an energetic spray of particles are coming out we need to capture those particles, their energies, and infer physics at the center. So this is what this uh, cartoon diagram is about, that we have many different kinds of elementary particles. They have their own way of interacting with others. They have their own method of depositing energy, making energy clusters, and we need to use this differentiable pattern, the different pattern of energy deposition, different pattern of particle production to capture what is happening. Okay, so this is just to show you that a quark versus a bead jet, whereas a top quark, which has three probe structure, we will explain all this. Uh, this is just a cartoon diagram. So let's go through these examples from LHC activities. The first thing which created a lot of excitement is the story of jet tagging from images. So what is a jet tagging? Just to make clear to you, in the collision, a spray of particle is coming out from the decay of probably a heavy particle or through splitting of an energetic particle. We need to capture all this particle as one set and we call this a jet. So what is a jet? It's in one liner, a four momentum, four numbers, one number for energy and three components of the momentum with all its constituents trying to represent what is happening at the center, which we don't know directly. And once we have a jet, we pass it through a neural network with trainable weight parameters. And we do a supervised learning. To do that, we take the help of simulations where we know from which kind of elementary particle this jet is originating. And accordingly in a classification task, we create something called a truth labeling. So here you can see that if we want to classify a jet into six categories, uh, we have the truth labeling as an example, one hot vector. And we use this pair of data to get a training of this neural network to get optimized wet parameter. And then eventually in an unseen sample, we try to evaluate the probabilities of a jet being uh, belonging to one of the categories of quark, gluon, B jet, C jet, et cetera. Okay. So uh, this is the kind of first classification task which started happening in the community of particle physics. physics. It's the jet tagging. So let's, uh, let me give you a real life example. The left-hand side is coming from a gluon showering. A gluon is a massless particle which we can never capture in reality. It just hadronizes very fast, but creates some bunch of hadrons. Whereas a top quark, which is actually the heaviest known elementary particle, it 
undergoes a decay into three different blobs. And that's the energy deposit pattern here. And we need to distinguish these two images to see whether the energy deposition pattern is coming from a top quark versus it's coming from a gluon jet. Okay, so the, and uh, as we discussed that this energy deposition pattern can be an image, can be a point cloud, and one has all possible neural networks to perform such tasks. And that what creates what we call a top tagger landscape. So what is this? So if you are familiar with classification task, you know that a performance metric is called receiver operator characteristics. What is it? It is how much given a tagger, given a discriminator, how well I can identify the signal with rejecting the background. So on the horizontal axis, we have the signal efficiency and on the vertical axis, we have the inverse of the efficiency of the background, which is called background rejection. And so if we can choose a working point in this plane where we have higher signal purity versus smaller presence of background, so that's better. So more and more we move to the diagonal right upwards in this plane, we see that uh, we have a better working tagger in that sense. And you can see that to perform the same task, how many different neural networks were used and they were all compared to each other, their performance. And finally, now we know that for such tasks, what we call particle net is essentially a graph neural network, which performs a dynamic edge convolution. And that's what performs best for this kind of tasks. Okay. So this was the first set of activities which started happening uh, within the high energy physics community. Now, top jets had three prongs. It was easy to identify. There are other kinds of jet identification which became uh, pretty important. And I will discuss shortly the physics motivation for that. This is a picture which is probably completely unfamiliar to you, but it's something easy to follow. You all have heard about Higgs boson. Okay. It made headlines all throughout the world in 2012, 4th July. This Higgs boson is an elementary particle and it has a short lifetime. So we can't catch it directly. It decays into a pair of particles. Let's call them A plus B. What this family of curves show you that what are the all possible modes in which a Higgs boson can decay. So you can think of this as a quantum mechanical process where an initial state of Higgs is decaying to two particles where the combination of two particles can change and all possible combinations form all possible eigenstates. And they are denoted here as WWZZ. If you have not heard about all the particles here, there is no harm. What is important that the physical Higgs mass, which we know of today around 125 GeV, this is this vertical line. And the Y axis is the probability of decay into each of these possible eigenstates. So you can clearly see that the highest probability mode in which Higgs boson can decay is a pair of bottom quarks. Okay, so this is what this curve tells you. And to our surprise, let me tell you that when we detected Higgs for the first time, it was not in this pair of bottom quark channels, but it was in the pair of two photons. And why it is so? And you see that the probability of decaying to a pair of B quarks is quite high compared to probability of a pair of photons because the Y axis is log. So it's exponentially larger we still detected into a pair of photons. And because this B jets, this mode is completely swamped by something called 
strong interaction background, QCT background. So we couldn't detect it at that time. So it really, it's really important to have a good BJET identification as well as a proper identification of Higgs to BB bar in order to catch these decay modes. And hence it's crucial to tag BJETs as well. So this is another example that a jet which has more features like a secondary decay mode inside uh, the core of the jet, they are uh, trying to identify to catch these B jets. Okay, so this is another receiver operator characteristics to show you that just uh, we can really tag these jets well as well. Now, in this context, I will tell you another mode of application. This is this is on going on growing and uh, it's pretty exciting. We told you about this 3D structure of jets, and now we apply a graph neural network for the real LHC collision data in order to identify what kind of particles are depositing energy. So. If you are a machine learning enthusiast, you know that graph neural networks are powerful. Uh, something called message passing neural networks are extremely powerful techniques. And we are using that to capture the properties of a jet. And not only that, uh, from our community, new kind of mathematical models for graph neural networks were proposed, which were generally accepted by the computer science community to perform this kind of tasks. So this is again, pretty exciting and interesting. Okay. So this is just to show you again uh, that, uh, okay, I need to check how I'm doing on the time. Just, okay, never mind. Right. So here it's another uh, performance metric just to show you that the graph neural network based methods actually surpassed all other pre-existing methods in order to perform this kind of classification tasks. So this goes the whole story of jet tagging their possible applications. And here I must again tell you that I'm not trying to tell you all possible literature that's available. I'm just trying to do a cherry picking and show you a few examples. Okay. One task of particle identification is done. I told you about pileups. So let me remind you what are pileups. Again, let's go back to the story of proton colliding with each other and not only one proton, but a hell lot of proton colliding with each other lots of energy is coming out. Many protons are not uh, colliding, actually going on collision with each other at all. So they are called beam remnants. And after that, this huge flash of energy is coming out. This energy, which contains the interesting one, as well as these junk ones are only available to infer what is happening at the center uh, where the interesting physics is happening. So if we don't have a good measurement of these energies, we will surely end up inferring wrong physics, what is happening at the center. So we need some cleanup. And this is what is called the whole mechanism of pileup removal. So earlier there were techniques, something called charged hadron subtraction. You don't need to know about these jargons. But uh, there were pre-existing non-ML techniques for pileup removal. And now it has been established that image-based pileup removal works well because this jet, they can be thought of as an image in the eta phi plane. And uh, you can apply multi-layered convolutional neural network to do a supervised regression task to identify given an image, which part is piled up, which part is not, and filter an image. This is purely applying the method of noise removal from an image, okay. And uh, we can get a reliable amount of estimation about the hard scattered energy. Similarly, this energy distribution in the two-dimensional plane of 
rapidity and azimuthal angle can be thought of a graph. So here, if you have all the energy deposited cluster, you can form probably a K nearest neighborhood graph to form a pile up, uh, to form an energy distribution. And you can pass this graph to multiple graph neural network layer to do a node classification and a node regression simultaneously. So that will tell you which particle is probably a pileup candidate and not. And if a particle is coming from an energy clump is coming from hard scattering, what is the probable energy? Okay, so this is the task which was done. And it was shown that uh, the resolution, the residual resolution of some observable called missing transverse energy uh, actually goes up when you apply the GNN best pile of removal compared to other previous methods. So this again shows you that uh, actually this works pretty well. Fine. The next example is triggering. So I told you at the start of the talk that we really need to do a real time large data volume reduction. And uh, this involves a hardware level selection criteria, as well as an offline level uh, reconstruction and selection method. And this has to be done every 25 nanoseconds. So this is really not only a question of large computation, but it's also a matter of fast computation. And can we do it better using machine learning? And that has been tried. And to do that, people are trying to apply neural network methods on <coughs> field programmable gate arrays, namely FPGAs, to make trigger decision and trying to execute neural network uh, on the FPGA hardware to build better triggers. And this is also a vast field of study. Okay, so this is again another example where machine learning is largely used. Fine. This example, the tracking is probably the hardest thing which is attempted using machine learning. What is tracking? So when a collision happens, all these particles which are coming out, most of them has an electric charge and they're flying in the presence of a strong magnetic field. So following Biosabot law, one can show that uh, how much it will bend but we need to measure this curvature. Okay, and what we all have is bunch of layers, physical layers, which are called tracking layers, and we can measure only the heat of the layers. So it becomes a large combinatorics problem that which of these hits one has to connect in order to reconstruct a track. And this is, with more number of hits in larger pileup scenario, this, is, this becomes an exponentially harder problem. So it became a real challenge to see if machine learning can improve our life. And for that, people came up with graph neural network based methods to establish that uh, really graph neural networks can ease our life by finding out which is the right age combination and what will be the right age weight uh, to detect the right, uh, to reconstruct the right track. Okay, so this is again a very exciting program and people are trying out quantum machine learning for these problems, which I'm not going to talk about in this talk. The third, uh, again, uh, it's not the third, but one of many is the, application of generative models in simulation in high energy physics. So all high energy physics analysis uh, depends a lot on simulations. We have to use standardized templates which are obtained from simulations. And these simulations are costly in the sense to produce a reliable simulation, you need to depend on a huge amount of computation resource. For example, to simulate one proton collision in a real life LHC, it's a 20 minutes of CPU time, so, which is a lot. And you have to simulate millions and millions of such events. 
So it was uh, asked uh, that whether one can come up with a generative model where you have a train network and just like this person doesn't exist or like producing a very reliable fake image can a well-trained neural network can just spit out an LHC event, which will have identical energies, identical tracks, etc., through a generative model. And it was found, yes, we can. And uh, this is what is compared. So in the bottom plots, what you see that the field histograms are some energy distributions of elementary particles like electron and photon, and there is ions in the events. And can a well-trained generative model gives a similar kind of energy distribution? So, and yes, you can. And this really tells us that uh, generative models can really be a game changer in this subdomain of applications. Okay, and here is another uh, recent paper from Atlas, which shows that in a com very, very high degree of complexity, the, a very well-trained generative model can almost match a real life detector simulation. So in terms of simulation frontier, this is a tremendous achievement. And these are the cases where uh, machine learning is really helping us a lot. Okay, so yeah, very exciting from our side. Then there are some other parallel ideas brewing up. One of such being the application of super resolution. So what is that? Uh, when we think about decay of heavy particles, which is going to a pair of particle, and if this particle is flying with very high energy, then the outcoming two particles, which are the daughters of the original one, they tend to be very close to each other or they tend to be collimated, which is shown in this above diagrams. So the more and more energy you have, the momentum you have of the initial particle, the decay products are more and more collimated. So now, if a situation arrives that we are looking into a particle which is super boosted, flying with very high energy, and it's decaying into two particles which are ending up in the same cell of a calorimeter. We can't distinguish these two particles as two different ones. So here comes the question, can we apply methods of super resolution, which just makes blur images better? Can we apply that to catch these two particles? So it was shown that, yes, that's also possible. So in this paper, uh, a method of graph neural network was proposed to catch the shower of uh, two decaying photons from a pion, which, which was for the first time super resolution methods were brought in the context of particle physics. And this also has potential to be very impactful within LHC experiments. Okay. Now, given that we talked about tracking and shower reconstruction. The holy grail of event reconstruction is the full algorithm called particle flow, where it tries to match a track with the shower energy deposition to identify what were all the particles created in an LHC collision and what uh, are the energies of all those probable particles should be. So this is like a very involved algorithm. And now we could replace it by a multi-stage uh, neural network involving graph and multi-layer perceptron and uh, fully connected feed forward networks, et cetera. So this is also very exciting. Like even three, four years back, this was unbelievable that you can replace a whole reconstruction chain in a real life complicated experiment via, uh, train neural network and that's what's happening now. So this is really exciting. Not only in the experimental reconstruction, but in the real data analysis, neural networks are used for BSM physics search. Uh, BSM stands for Beyond Standard Model Physics, which we haven't seen in nature. 
but there are very strong theoretical motivations to foresee them in the future. Okay, and this is just to show you that uh, in we are applying uh, machine learning based discrimination methods to search for new physics. And here in this example, a heavy neutral scalar has been searched in the final state of four leptons. Of course, we didn't find it until now. If it were, you could have read it in Times of India, but uh, uh, we didn't find it. But still, uh, the latest more, more methods of machine learning are always tried on this kind of searches. So this is, again, exciting. So until now, I, I was giving you all possible integrities of experimental particle physics and application of machine learning in experimental particle physics, which I work with. So for the next 10 minutes or so, I will try to give you some highlights where in the other branches of particle physics, machine learning is very closely used. Uh, and uh, it's also true that before the machine learning boom, the theoretical and experimental particle physicists used to exchange results with each other, but they were not so keen on working together. Now the application of machine learning in high energy physics is a domain where actually theoreticians and experimentalists are sitting side by side and are working together to produce great results. So this is again a very exciting uh, new collaboration window which has opened up through machine learning applications. Okay, so I will tell you that. So first, an application uh, which is in general hard. So any one of you who have done a higher order perturbation theory calculation in quantum field theory, they know that computing renormalized matrix elements is a non-trivial business. Okay, and uh, uh, the more the number of particles in final state increases, it becomes harder and harder. And similarly, the higher ordering perturbation theory, if you want to compute, it's also equally harder. So this was a nice paper which was tried to see that, okay, in an event generator, in a simulator, you can always give input particles and try to estimate what's the cross-section, the differential cross-section. So if you use this pair of data as input versus target, can you train a neural network to predict differential cross-section? And it was found out that yes, you can do, even for a higher order theory, which is in general complicated. And for reference, just, just let me remind you that the cross-section is actually the transition amplitude matrix element mod square and integrated over the final state phase space. So whatever particle coming out in a process, it's called final phase, uh, final state. And you need to integrate over the momentum phase space of those particles. And both of them are individually complicated tasks. So at this stage, we don't know which part is neural network learning better, whether to compute matrix element or to evaluate the final phase space integral. But nonetheless, it's really <coughs> learning to compute this grand integral properly, which is really fascinating. There are other cases. So people always try out writing parameters of new model. And here you can see that it's an effective field theory Lagrangian. And whenever there is a new model uh, in the present in the absence of new signal, what one performs is to constrain the parameter space of new model. So this is bread and butter stuff for people like Amit et al. Okay, so just constraining the parameter space. And here you can see that using machine learning, people have compared what kind of parameter space one 
can exclude using the standard canonical method versus other machine learning methods. And uh, uh, can application of uh, neural networks really improve our life? So this is also an exciting field of study. And uh, again, this is not exhaustive in the sense I just plugged out some examples uh, from my favorite list, but you are welcome to look into all the literature which I linked at the end of my talk. And uh, here is another example in which other fields uh, machine learning is used within particle physics. You can see there are application of machine learning in lattice field theory heavily. People are trying to do sampling in the lattice field theory using normalizing flow, et cetera. There are attempts to learn the structures of Calabi-U manifold, and uh, there are applications of machine learning in string theory as well. Although it's not mainstream in string theory, but I know a subset of people are trying to learn the geometrical structures using neural networks, which are pretty exciting as well. So essentially it's a very active field that application of machine learning in all branches of particle physics. And not only particle physics, I would say, if you go to fluid dynamics, cosmology, astrophysics, condensed matter physics, everywhere you will find uh, application of neural networks are becoming very, very important. So given that in the last five, six years, we have learned really new application of neural networks can make our life better. What are the next immediate priorities in this lane? That's uh, need to be addressed. One is to compute uncertainty. One can always find out a performance curve, a receiver operator characteristics, et cetera. But if we have a neural network prediction, but can't uh, give a reliable uh, uncertainty on the predicted quantity, then that result is not faithful within the analysis of science. So we need to have an interpretable extraction of uncertainty estimation on the prediction of neural network. Here I have shown you an example of uh, mixture density networks on the node regression. So this is, uh, if you know uh, mixture models, that's fine. But otherwise, it's important that not only neural networks will predict a value, but it should also be able to predict a distribution about the value so that you can really measure the width of the distribution and quote it as an uncertainty on the prediction. The other part being explainability. Today in the first talk, we heard a lot about interpretable AI. So when we do physics, we have always try to have a first principle uh, understanding of the results we obtain. We try to solve Newton's laws. We try to compute path integrals from the partition functions we have. And finally, we have a theory prediction. So when in a canonical analysis, when our data falls on the theory line, we really understand why such a distribution is coming from the first principle. And that is also required from ML predictions. So if uh, a trained neural network predicts some physics, then we really need to understand why such a prediction has been made, what is lying deep down the line. And that's very crucial. And a lot of effort is going on in this direction. Okay. And what lies in the immediate future? What has become very trendy to use uh, the symmetry properties of a neural network uh, to see whether we can learn underlying hidden symmetry features of a data. So something like Lie group equivariant network is uh, becoming pretty mainstream. People are already writing like translation and rotation equivariant networks, Lorentz boost invariant networks, and they're pretty powerful. So I just wanted to show you what happens that if you construct a transformer network, which preserves the generalized Lie group symmetry, it easily, learns gravitational dynamics. So this is the GIF. 
uh, I got from the GitHub of Lead Transformer, and that's amazing that you have many body gravitational dynamics, which is very, very hard problem to solve analytically. Most of the cases you can't solve and you have to take help of numerical methods and a well-trained Lee group equivariant transformer network can predict it so well. You can see the trajectories of ground truth versus model prediction. So we also want to apply this kind of symmetry equivariance power of a neural network in the analysis of high energy physics. Okay. So I think uh, it's been a long collection of examples and a very short introduction to high energy physics activities at the start. So let's try to wind up. Uh, I hope I could maintain the time for the talk. So what we are looking to. First, to tell you, you needn't be a particle physicist by training to try out machine learning for particle physics. There are lots of open data sets and Kaggle competitions where you can go. I have listed the websites and uh, you can try out these data sets. Even with zero understanding of particle physics, you can handle this data set and try to see if this kind of physical science motivated machine learning processes uh, can teach you something. So that's very exciting. Okay. And uh, I, I really invite you to try out this LHC Olympics, track ML, the jet tagging examples, which I showed you to try them out, all the data sets and initial uh, scripts to handle these data sets are publicly available. And finally, let's uh, come to the summary page. So in this talk, I didn't derive any result to give a core summary, but nonetheless, I tried to give you a big picture. So what's the takeaway from this, let's say 50 odd minutes of presentation? High energy physics was there and will be there because we are not going to uncover the deepest mysteries in next few years. No, even not next few decades. So high energy program will sustain for centuries to come. This quest of grand truth of nature, human beings will go after it. And data crunching will become more and more and more important with advent of most modern experiments and most modern analytical tools. So machine learning and particle physics, this handshake, the bondage will stay strong. And this is also true for all domains of natural and social science. Machine learning will become an unavoidable part. So it's very important that uh, we, the two communities talk with each other and try to understand each other pretty well. And it's not that only we are buying methods from machine learning community and applying within our science domain. It's also true that uh, particle physicists are coming up with new neural network architectures and models which are published in neuro IPS and ICLR, et cetera. So there is also a contribution from our domain to the neural network domain, et cetera. And you can see that there was ML for physical science kind of workshop, which are part of the mainstream machine learning workshop. So yeah, we are having fun together. That's all the takeaway message. And if you want to have a look at exhaustive set of literature connection, uh, please visit these websites. So yeah, thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you very much uh, for a very wonderful talk. Uh, there are already many questions. So right, let me... uh, let's go through some of them. So uh, okay, the first one is uh, from Arindam Basu. Uh, Arindam, if you are here, can you please unmute uh, yourself and ask the question yourself? Uh, otherwise, I can read it out. 
Sorry, Dom. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, uh, let's just read the question. Uh, okay. What Arindam is asking is, uh, during the filtering out uh, the large amount of data, lots of data are lost and thus trace of some particles uh, may also be lost. Correct. Uh, is that, yeah, so that's what he is asking, is that? Uh, that is the case. And uh, since mm -hmm. we are constrained with physical storage of data, uh, it's just our inability to store the data. So we always lose something. So all these algorithms of trigger are invented so that we store the more interesting part of the data and throw away the non-interesting part of the data. That's where this algorithm plays the role. So that uh, we put out best of our effort to store the useful data. So that's since we can't store all the data. So that's the whole trigger story is all about. Uh, okay. The next question is from Josh uh, Chaurasia. So Josh, if you are, if you can unmute and ask yourself, or should I read out? Yeah, maybe I should just read because um, he's asking that in the top tagging scenario, does the background signal mean data from the calorimeter originating from a jet of say things like other quarks? Exactly, so let's, uh, good. Let's go back to this picture. I think you can still see the slides, right? Yeah. So this is the bottom right is a schematic diagram of uh, top quark decay. So mm -hmm. almost all the time, first top quark decays to a bottom quark and a W boson, and the W boson further decays to a pair of light quarks or a charm or a strange. So essentially, when a top quark decays, all you get three particles. And that's why you see a bulge of energy of three clusters. If you are trying to identify whether a jet is top quark or not, versus the, like if that's your signal and the background be can be a W jet, which has a two lobe structure or a light pattern jet, which has one lobe structure, you just look into the energy distribution. Even without going into a neural network, if you just do a K clustering algorithm, this will tell you there are three center of masses in this energy distribution. And that can already give you a high degree of signal efficiency. Now, if there is a very energetic gluon jet, in some cases, it can really spit out much amount of energy and can give you this extended energy distribution. That's the case where a human eye can't distinguish between the energy deposition pattern of a top jet versus, let's say, a gluon jet. And that's where a well-trained neural network can come into play to increase the prediction efficiency for this classification task. Um, okay, the next question is uh, from Shivam uh, Varma. Um, what Shivam is asking is that, can you please tell if one does particle collision simulation using mat graph and hadros nice, with Pythia, how can we get from Pythia such eta phi images to feed to our neural network for training? How does so, one reach this gap between Pythia to deep learning input image generation? And can you give a reference of the same? That's oh, same. sure, sure. So uh, I'm sure he's doing some project with particle physics. No, so uh, Shivam, uh, when you see Pythia outcome, you have stable particles and each particle has its own eta phi from its kinematics, the momentum distribution, and you also have the energy. So given an event, you know which uh, location of the eta phi it's going and what's its energy. So if you form an eta phi grid, you already have an image from uh, 
the PTR data set itself. How to store, technically store? You can, with PTR, you can easily store it, say, in form of root or uh, HEPMC, et cetera. So if you are working with Mancraft and PTR, you probably know HEPMC and root as well. You can store the event information at per event level. And then what you really need is something analogous to a custom data loader, what we call in PyTorch, which will read the data set from HEPMC or root and will convert into say a torch tensor, or if you're using TensorFlow, then it will convert into a TensorFlow tensor or a NumPy tensor. And then uh, the standardized neural network packages can take this data representation uh, into input and can use it. You can also use uh, this package called uproot, which directly converts a root and tuple entry to NumPy arrays, which is most convenient. You can use that even without having root installed in your machine. So if you really need uh, more information, just send me an email. I can point you to professional examples. Um, <clears throat> there are more questions uh, for Arindam again, uh, is that to have a good trace of new family of particles, what kind of data should be fed into ML? So you don't have much choice about kind of data. All you have is this concept of an event out of which different objects like jets, photons, leptons, etc., are coming out. And you can have a representation of this data set as an image or a graph, point cloud, et cetera. So that's, that's where your data set representation stops. You can't go much beyond that. Where you can play yourself is to come up with more and more fancy neural networks to see if in a simulation, you can increase the identification performance for new physics. But this is all on simulation. When you go to data, we don't know whether there are new physics at all or not. I mean, okay, there should be, but uh, it's, it's not easy to tell. Okay. Uh, next question is that, uh, if the decay products from some particles all end up in one block of a calorimeter, can't we simply count that signal as detection of the original particle? No. Why? Because let's say a particle, a standard model particle, which we know to exist, it can be a Higgs to a pair of photons, it can be a W to a pair of two jets, if it's extremely boosted. And if, if it is extremely boosted, both the daughter particles will end up into one closed region of the calorimeter. And it might happen that in extremely boosted case, say in HLLHC, uh, such a decay happens that both the particles coming from a heavier particle, both land into the same cell. Does that mean it's a new physics? No, never. It's the same old known particle. They were just flying with a high amount of boost and hence the uh, DK product ended up being very collimated and landed up in a narrow region of calorimeter. Now, can there be an unknown particle which deposits similar kind of energy spectrum? The answer is yes, it can be. So how do you study that? The only current known way is to model those uh, particle interactions in, uh, in the simulation, you create something called LHG files, undergo mad graph, Delphis, et cetera, to get spectrum what will be those new particles are going to generate. And then see if you can identify with the known pa boosted particles as background. So this is the only game for the time being you can play, not much more than that. Um, then I go to, I mean, there are some other questions by the people who already asked some questions. So 
Let's go to someone else as Mithunja Shahu. Uh, he's asking that in the jet representation, is it flux on the y-axis? And what is this eta here? So oh, so eta is the pseudo rapidity. So you can think of the following. Uh, when you study the three-dimensional motion of a particle, you always have in a spherical polar coordinate, you have the distance from the origin, which is called R. Then you have the angle of the particle location vector with respect to the Z axis, which is called polar angle. You call it theta. And then you have an azimuthal angle, which is the angle made by the projection of the uh, position vector with respect to the x-axis. Okay, so this is what defines the R theta phi coordinate system. Given the theta, you can compute another parameter, which is minus half log tan theta. It's a complicated functional form. Uh, and that's called pseudo rapidity. Now you can ask why this quantity, why this fancy quantity pseudo rapidity? It's found that uh, by now you're convinced probably that we are talking about relativistic particles. We are talking about high energy. And if you take the difference of the pseudo rapidity of two particles, eta one minus eta two delta eta, this quantity is invariant under boost along the Z axis. Typically the axis we talk in collider physics, the axis of symmetry. So whether you're doing measurement sitting at the laboratory or you're talking about some physical quantity in the center of momentum frame of all those tiny particles, you know if you measure the distribution with respect to delta eta, that is invariant. And that's why this eta quantity somehow becomes very, very crucial for people like us, the particle physicists, because it has this nice property of frame independence under Lorentz transformation, the longitudinal boost. So that, that, that's the actual answer. Okay. Um, the next question is from Yash again, is that, is there a possibility of reconstructing the calculation using invertible operations in ML, like flows, and gain more insights of the theoretical calculations? The answer is ideally it should be. Like uh, when you talk about normalization flow, the whole idea is that the neural network can be built out of many small pieces of invertible network. That's the normalizing flow where you map an input distribution, let's say a random number distribution to a desired distribution. And you have correctly identified that in particle physics, we are always referring to uh, probability distribution of different observables. Now, can this be uh, used to in for the first principle interpretation? I don't think so as of now, uh, because the methods are not too mature. Uh, when we talk about first principle understanding, we always refer to a Lagrangian, which determines uh, uh, the dynamics of the problem. But when you talk about distribution, you can you will have more than one differentiable distribution. You will have d sigma dpt, you will have d sigma d eta and some this kind of other distributions. And when you try to use flow, not the same normalization flow kind of fit forward network will not map all this distribution. You need to train different networks. So with the current day state of the art flow methods, we can't do that. But uh, we can remain optimistic that in future, this uh, flow-based methods will evolve even more and better understanding of the theoretical calculations will come up so that we can have an interpretable uh, networks to identify uh, whether our Lagrangian best understanding of physics matches with the interpretation of the neural network. So that's, that's my take on this problem. 
Um, then the other question is from Shivam. Uh, to identify a top, let's say, our neural network needs to first be trained. Are there pre-tagged images available for training the model? Will it work for a boosted particle as well? I, 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 sorry, I, I didn't follow the question. Okay. So to identify a top, let's say, our neural network needs to first be trained. Yes. So are there pre-tagged images available for training the model? And will it work for a boosted particle as well? So first, there is pre-tagged uh, images. No, they are not available. What, what is available is always the truth leveling. So whatever image you have, you always have uh, truth leveling. So if you're talking about tagging at the truth level, then all the images have a truth leveling. And then uh, you have to use this raw data to do whatever you want to do. This is the data readily available. Uh, okay, then if anyone else has a question, Amit maybe was, you were mentioning you had some questions, so please go ahead. Yeah, uh, but there is one question very soon. Do you want to take that? Oh, I, I don't know. Just last I, I question to... from. Oh, there are too many, but maybe one question from Mithunjoy. Oh, several. So, yeah. Mithunjoy, I have. Okay. So, the other question is that you said the, uh, we do have some theoretical framework for physics beyond standard model, but they are not experimentally detected. So, is there any modification? in the theory still now according to experimental evidence. Okay. So first building, so there are two parts in this game, building a new theory. And when you build a new theory, there are involved parameters, which are typically the coupling constants of the Lagrangian. Okay. So people play two kinds of games. First, they bring new terms in the Lagrangian and they put new kind of coupling constants before these new terms. And in the second part, on the existing BSM theories, they keep on putting new constraints on the, let's say, known terms in the Lagrangian. So this is a game, let's say Amit is expert of. Is, uh, for last 10 years, he's doing all this. So, excluding yeah. models and all this stuff. So, yeah, uh, yeah. But of course, you have to preserve certain symmetry, first principle symmetry to, uh, to prescribe new terms in a Lagrangian or to um, model a new physics. But uh, given uh, the constraint of some symmetries, you can come up with anything you like to. Then you, of course, have to check that uh, in all possible channels where we can do measurement, whether your pres prescription is still allowed or is consistent with the measured data. So this is the task of the phenomenologists. OK, uh, maybe we just have three more minutes. Uh, so uh, Sanmai, first of all, brilliant presentation, as always. Thank you so much. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. The first one is uh, you mentioned about uh, super resolution for yeah. this uh, pi not going to two gamma, right? This kind of yeah. some development there. Uh, I was just wondering uh, how about uh, this method is applicable for let's say some light scalar particle, which uh, may be photon. Uh, so uh, uh, it's actually uh, I mean I, I wrote that paper and. Uh, it's, it's doable for anything. It's like a particle A going to B plus C and where this B plus C is just collimated. So the principle which we developed, I gave a scheme in this. So what paper. kind of resolution you are talking about? Uh, this number quantitatively? So re resolution wise, uh, let's say you have the typical cells in the yeah. real LHC is 0 0.01 cross 0 0.01 in the delta eta delta phi. Okay. okay. 
and then you split that cell into eight by eight grid or four by four grid, one cell. So, okay. Okay. And okay. Uh, that's the kind of super resolution which you can achieve starting from a 0 0.01 cell to 0 0.01 cell. So that will in, give me some way of some the measurement of the boost also, right? Because these two are connected. Yeah, if the, I assume the opening angle is the measure oh, yeah. of the boost. yeah. So so that way I can connect this with uh, the particle itself. Okay. So here we showed that even in presence of noise and overlapping showers, we could really disentangle the two photons which were coming from a pi naught decay. But if you have the regular granularity of a detector. Uh, even the truth image cannot capture the two photon structure of the pi zero decay. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And so the, another question is: uh, we had a lot of uh, discussion in the first talk in this meeting about this explainable or interpretable machine learning. I just wanted to know because you deal with the real data and from the sun, so. Do a CERN has set up any sort of uh, group uh, or some dedicated works which are based on this interpretable machine learning using the real data? Because theorists are doing this. So here, when you say in experimental site, what we are doing right now uh, in terms of, let's say, we do a jet tagging or some jet shape regression using machine learning. What property of individual jet constituent is getting translated to the decision of a jet tagger? That's the kind of question we are trying through interpretable machine learning. So that's why I highlighted this picture of what is called GNN explainer. This is one of the best bets right now. So we are always uh, applying graph neural networks to perform tasks for the tagging of an object or uh, trying to calibrate an object, even trying to tag an event. And there, this algorithm tells us what low level features gets translated to make the decision, was used by a trained neural network to make the decision or whatever task it is made for. And this algorithm gives us. So this is the kind of thing we are doing. Uh, and now when uh, theorists are doing, probably they are looking into a small angle soft radiation kind of issue for a jet tagging or depending on what task they are doing. These two are not completely Decent and right now, the maturity of these tasks are take it case by case and try to first explain at the low level. And when you make a grand combination, then you see whether you get more insight out of the interpretability. Okay, so, so you, you first mostly focus still on using the model, using the uh, ML setup, and then you think about its interpretability right now, right? It's not. Uh, yeah. so, so, first you check whether at all ML can do the task you want to do. Once yeah. that is done, then this interpretable issue, interpretability issue is not readily available for all kind of neural networks. Yeah, exactly. For, for graph neural networks, a message passing neural network, you have that uh, GNN explainer. But uh, let's say you go and just use a um, stack of multi-layer perceptron. Then it's very hard to tell you what it learned. OK. Mm. So some, some image-based one seems like uh, some uh, methods. Uh, like image -based, you can look into different part of images and try yeah. to see which part uh, gave us the explanation. But as you said, I mean, it's, it's also on one of the active uh, direction, I believe. For yeah, yeah, yeah. Next yeah. four or five years. Uh, one is the explainability, and other is the uncertainty determination. These are two very crucial for long run application of machine learning. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, actually. This is very nice talk.
um, yeah, hopefully we have uh, the opportunity to hear from you again and possibly in our campus. And our sure, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank so, you so much. Uh, Bye. Yeah. Um, so the next speaker and the last speaker for this um, one day symposium is Professor Lasse Larson. So uh, Lasse, do you, do you hear me? Sorry, I was muted. So yes, yeah. I hear you. Okay, okay, good. good. Okay, and so, yeah, so shall we start? Yeah, why not? Okay, okay. So, so I guess I can uh, share my screen. Yeah, you can please share your screen. So, um, so Professor Lasse Larsson, he did his PhD in the Helsinki University of Technology in Finland. And then he did his postdoc in complex materials group in Turin, Italy. And then uh, he was an Academy of Finland postdoctoral researcher in Alto University. Uh, he was also an invited visiting researcher in CNRS in Lyon. And then finally, he joined as an associate professor in Tampere University uh, in computational physics lab, and where he's currently a professor. And uh, he works in this uh, plastic deformation and uh, um, domain wall uh, motions. And uh, among other things. And the title of his talk today is Machine Learning Plastic Deformation of Crystals. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, let's go ahead. So, thank you very much. And thank you very much for this uh, invitation uh, to present this stuff here in this uh, nice event. Unfortunately, I could not uh, join earlier. Well, it was still kind of early here in Finland, and uh, I also had some other things to do. but but uh, I, I made it to uh, give this talk anyway. So yeah, so I'm going to talk about machine learning of plastic deformation of crystals, okay? So, well, the, the problem is basically here. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, maybe yes. So um, you yes. have some, uh, some, some crystal, uh, crystalline material, some sample of a crystalline material, which has some microstructure, let's say. You have some dislocation lines there, you might have some other defects like uh, these kind of red precipitate pa particles. And, uh, and then uh, you, you apply some stresses. And of course, as a result, you get some kind of a response, which looks like this. So you get the stress strain curve and you might want to sort of uh, uh, predict uh, what features of this initial uh, configuration of your crystal, the microstructure, uh, determine what kind of um, uh, structure, uh, well, structure of the stress strain curve, which is the, the, the response to external stresses that you end up getting. And uh, yeah, the middle part here is some sort of a machine learning model. So we try to use machine learning to kind of infer these kind of mappings from the uh, initial microstructure to the actual response that you end up getting when you apply stresses. So this is of course work that have been, uh, has been done in uh, collaboration with many people who are, who are listed here. So um, most of these people are actually the ones who, who know more about the technical stuff that, than I do, but uh, I'm going to try, try my best to actually explain what these guys have been doing. So, okay, so, so first of all, uh, I have been asked to always advertise when I speak uh, about something uh, some outside of Finland, I'm always asked to advertise the fact that uh, there's this thing called Tampere University where I'm from. And the reason for that is that it's actually a young university. So it's founded uh, in 2019, so like three years ago. And uh, it was actually a merger of uh, three different research institutes in the Tampere region, uh, which merged in 2019 to form this uh, new university called Tampere University, which is actually in terms of the number of students and, and staff is the second largest in Finland of the University of Helsinki. So it's located here. Uh, I don't know if you know where Finland is, it's in Northern Europe. Helsinki, the capital is here and Tampere is like here. It's a beautiful uh, city surrounded by lakes. Uh, if you have a chance to visit, you're always welcome to come, come here. Okay, um, so that was the, the obligatory uh, introduction to my university. So then uh, the actual stuff. So of course, I mean, as I already kind of uh, briefly tried to explain, um, I mean, in, in plasticity, especially if you look at small crystals, um, what you will end up finding out is that uh, when you try to uh, slowly deform some small crystal, 
uh, actually the way it deforms is that it uh, there are some avalanches or strain bursts of, of this kind of pl plastic activity uh, which seems to be kind of hard to sort of predict I mean it's kind of stochastic and all, all this stuff so it's it's a kind of a challenge to to, to say that okay if I have a have a specific microstructure in my crystal how it will actually end up deforming when I apply some stress um, well so, so first I, I will discuss this kind of general phenomenology a little bit to kind of set the stage uh, and then uh, also introduce the model that we are using because we are I'm a computational physicist so, so we do we don't do actually experiments we, we do numerical simulations of this problem and then try to sort of predict this numerical data that we get from those simulations uh, and then I move into uh, uh, discussing the application of machine learning to kind of find these mappings from the initial state to actual uh, plastic deformation response to applied stresses. And yeah, so then uh, we have we have these models that we are we are using to generate the data and uh, so on and so forth. Okay, so so like the kind of key experimental um, background here is that if you take uh, this type of micro pillars, so they are like uh, some pillars of some metal uh that are have a size in the micrometer range so like i don't know a few micrometers or maybe 10 micrometers in this range and then you uh compress these with a nano indenter so it's a kind of a small thing that you use to push this compress these pillars and you can record the stress as a functional strain for these samples of different sizes and what you will find out is that especially in, the, in these small samples um you have these fluctuations in the response. So you have this kind of a staircase-like structure of your stress strain curve, um, which consists of these kind of strain bursts, which are the, the uh, horizontal segments, and then some uh, stress increments in between. And this is a kind of a stochastic thing. So it, it looks like these are roughly speaking random. And also if you repeat the, sim uh, the, the experiment uh, using a similar sample, so the same size, same uh, preparation protocol, uh, you will get sample to sample fluctuation. So even if you've got kind of similar uh, samples, the response will be a bit different every time if you're looking at small samples that is. There's also another size effect here, which is that uh, larger systems uh, at a given strain, they tend to have a larger stress. Uh, sorry, smaller smaller samples have a, have a larger stress at the, at the given strain. So they are kind of stronger in some sense. So, so smaller is stronger is one of the, one of the ways to express this size effect. Then the other thing is that smaller is also wilder. I mean, wild fluctuations is the kind of technical term here. So if you have like a, a very broad distribution of, of these uh, strain bursts, then you can say, okay, your process is wild in some sense. Uh, while if you increase the system size towards the bulk sample, uh, these kind of fluctuations actually gradually disappear and you end up having a kind of a smooth stress strain curve uh, in, the, in the bulk limit, so in the limit of a macroscopic uh, sample. But this is kind of the, the experimental phenomenology uh, if you look at the stress strain curve. Then you can also look at uh, these large samples where the stress strain curve usually is smooth, but you can uh, also kind of monitor this plastic activity in different ways. So one is to, to record the acoustic emission that is coming from the deforming sample. So here, for instance, is an ice single crystal that you, you compress, uh, and then you can uh, attach some acoustic emission transducer, and uh, you can look at the... Uh, the uh, uh, energies of these acoustic emission events that uh, are emitted from this deforming sample, and these will end up having this kind of power law distribution, so very broad distribution with wide range of scales. So you have this kind of a critical like signature of the of the um, plastic deformation process, also in these large crystals where you don't really see any the anything interesting in the stress strain curves because these are smooth, but yet you you still observe this um, uh, kind of crackling noise, if you like. Uh, coming from the crystal even in this case. So the kind of a general conclusion is that the crystalline materials, when they deform, they, they crack. So, so they, they in the small systems, they, they uh, display this uh, strain burst, uh, which can have, have a wide, broad distribution. And in, in the larger system, there's, there's acoustic emission events. And these originate from some collective dynamics of dislocations in the crystal, because uh, plastic deformation, of course, is, uh, is a process that is mediated by the stress-driven motion of these dislocations, which are kind of topological line-like defects uh, that live in your crystal. Um, yeah, so, so of course, I mean, uh, now because I'm a computational physicist, I, I, I want to... Uh, model this thing and not not do experiments uh, and also i'm kind of a statistical physicist let's say uh, so i like simple model 
rather than a very complex model. So, so a simple model of this kind of a system where you have dislocations that move and produce plastic strain could be the one shown here. So, so here uh, you have these uh, blue and red symbols, which are dislocations of two different signs. So they have a kind of a topological charge associated with them, which is called the Burgers vectors. And uh, yeah, so in this simple geometry where the dislocations are only allowed to move in the horizontal direction, you have like two signs uh, for this thing, uh, two, two different uh, signs of the dislocation. These are edge dislocations, so, so atomic, on, on the atomic scale, they would look like this, but here they are just point particles in some elastic, continuous elastic medium. Um, yeah, so for, some, from, from elasticity theory, you can uh, work out uh, what kind of uh, strain fields these, these, these objects are surrounded with. Uh, so they look like this, so they are kind of complicated, so they are long range, anisotropic. Uh, yeah, so that gives rise to some interesting phenomena, like some patterning that you, you end up having here. So these are not just uh, some uh, gas particles that are randomly dispersed in this medium, but they, they form some structures there. And um, yeah, so, so here uh, are the equations of motion. You basically just say, okay, your velocity of dislocation is proportional to the total stress acting on it. So, and this can have contribution from the interactions and from the externally applied stress. And as a result, if you do the simulation, you, you get this kind of typical stress strain curve that looks a bit like the one that you get from these microfilar compression experiments. So you have this kind of a bursty uh, deformation dynamics also from this model. Uh, yeah, so, so then, um, Okay, so, so, so there are of course now different regimes of, of, of this plasticity here. So one is uh, where you only basically have this dislocation, so you don't have any additional defects in your crystal, only dislocated moving around and forming maybe some structure, but uh, no other defects to interact with for the dislocation. So in this case, what we have is so, something we call dislocation jamming. So the dislocations form these kind of uh, structures due to some self-induced constraints uh, for the motion. And that's why eventually, if you just keep the stress constant uh, with a small value, the dynamics will eventually stop. And then if, to keep the deformation going on, you have to increase the stress a little bit and trigger some additional activity and so on and so forth. So, so here uh, we have a kind of a scaling picture, which is a little bit uh, special. It's not really that important for the purposes of that talk, uh, this specific talk, because we are going to focus on the machine learning part. But I'm just going to mention that there is a kind of a special uh, way the uh, the um, uh, let's say the cutoff of this avalanche distribution, which is a power law in general, which is a cutoff. So the cutoff scale of that distribution exhibits some sort of a weird scaling, which is a little bit uh, atypical for, for, let's say, in the pers kind of general perspective of this avalanche avalanching systems. So, so there's something called extended criticality, as we like to call it. So, so the system is in some sense critical for, for all stresses. But again, this is not maybe the most important thing here. Uh, then we can also, in principle, look at uh, look at uh, what happens if you add some uh, additional defects in your in your in your system. So, so some pinning points interacting with the dislocations, and um, and uh, yeah, so 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 this uh, this could change the nature of the of the of this fluctuating dynamics a little bit. So instead of this kind of a jamming, you actually have a process process which mo looks more like this kind of a typical uh, phenomenon of deep pinning. Uh, transition. So, so you can think of like some elastic manifolds in, in, in random media, uh, like dome walls or cracks or whatnot. So, so, so the, the scaling picture will look more like that. In that case. Of course, here, uh, I'm not going to actually uh, look into that too much. So, so that's just kind of an anecdote here. Okay, so, so there's this uh, summary of the kind of phenomenology of this model that we are going to use for, for machine learning now. Uh, we're actually focusing on this, this pure system case where you have uh, only the dislocations, no, no other defects, and, uh, and see what you get, uh, get as a result. Um, yeah, okay, then of course we have also done some uh, 3D simulations. Of course, in reality, these crystals would be three-dimensional, and in that case, the dislocations would be actually lines rather than points in this simple 2D model. Um, we can kind of uh, reproduce the same kind of phenomenology also in this 3D system, but it's much more complicated, and much more computationally expensive to simulate. So it's kind of a little bit more tricky in that sense. Um, okay, so th this is basically the problem statement here. So, so, so now you have this, um, um, well, so, 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 so your, your simulations are basically started like this. So you put uh, some, a bunch of these uh, dislocations uh, in your 2D box, initially at, at random positions, then you let them relax uh, in the absence of any external stresses. And you end up 
a configuration that might look like this. So there's some structure there because uh, the dislocations interact and they like to move to some energetically favorable configuration. Um, but then uh, when you apply stresses, uh, you can uh, then uh, record a stress strain curve that might, might look like one of those, those curves here. Uh, and then you can repeat this procedure. So you, get, you generate another random uh, initial dislocation configuration to relax. You get another state that looks a little bit different from this one. Uh, and, and then you get a different stress strain curve. So you have this, sam this sample, sample to sample fluctuations that actually are pretty large uh, in, in small systems. So now the question is, what, what exactly is the link between the, the initial state here and the stress strain curve that you, you, you get uh, when you apply stresses? So can you somehow establish some link um, between the, some features of this initial state and the stress strain curve? Of course, now this is a kind of a subtle point because, of course, you could you could argue that okay, uh, this is a deterministic system. So if I know exactly where my dislocations are in this initial state, then I can construct a model which would be basically equivalent to these equations of motion here, which are deterministic. So so I, I should exactly be able to um, kind of find a mapping from this uh, initial state to the stress strain curve because it's a deterministic system. However, it's uh, in practice, it's more complicated than that because uh, you have this complex dynamics going on. So you have these avalanches, critical like avalanches that are actually uh, often understood to be in inherently unpredictable. Um, so it's kind of the dynamics process like this that you are kind of always on the verge of stopping, but then you might still keep going for a long time, for instance. So, so it's a it's a it's a very kind of sensitive thing. I mean, uh, what, what exactly happens? So, so let's say you you for instance would be interested in uh, finding this kind of a relation between the initial state and the response in an experimental system, where your information of the initial state and also the information of the of the type of dynamics that your dislocation in your in your experimental system will exhibit is incomplete. So it's not one hundred percent precise. So under those kind of con conditions what can you say about this uh, this map so that's basically the problem here okay so so of course i i have no i mean if i just look at this uh, this initial state myself i mean i i have no idea uh, which of these stress strain curves would correspond to that specific initial state but maybe uh machine learning uh, would help so maybe the machines could help uh, or learn something that i myself am unable to learn so to get started with, I mean, uh, we, we first, uh, um, well, started by taking these kind of, uh, well, first of all, generate the big data set, okay? So we uh, created a bunch of these initial configurations uh, with this procedure where you first put your dislocation in, in the system randomly, let them relax and you get, you get, uh, get uh, such a configuration and repeat it several times. So like 5,000 5, to 10,000 times. So a large data set. And then from each of these initial configurations, you, you, you generate some, uh, some descriptors. So this could be related to the, something called the geometric necessary dislocation density, which is basically just the difference of the densities of these positive and negative dislocations in your system. You could also look at some uh, features of this internal stress field that actually looks kind of complicated because you have all these dislocations that are sort of uh, forming this complex structure and each of them is producing its own stress field. So the sum of those will look kind of nice and complicated. So then you can extract the various kind of statistical uh, descriptors of those fields. Um, and uh, yeah, and then you can feed those to the input layer of, of, of a neural network, let's say, or some other machine learning one. Let's, uh, let's uh, for the sake of discussion, look at a simple neural network. So you have an input layer with a bunch of, bunch of descriptors that you constructed from this initial configuration. Then you have some uh, hidden layers, in this case, three. And uh, then you, you well, just... Uh, you use some rect uh, some activation function, which is here the rectifier, and then you uh, try to um, um, train this this network to learn the mapping from these descriptors to the stress at the given strain. Okay, so this would be like the point along the stress strain curve that you are interested in. And um, yeah, so then, then of course you can do this with this, this uh, neural network, but then you can also use some other other machine learning models to somehow. Uh, check how general your, your, your results will be. So we also, for this specific study, we also used a support vector machine to complement this neural network. So the, the logic is like this. So, so you have these initial states, then you, you have all these features, which you feed to this, uh, this uh, machine learning model, and you get some prediction for your, for your stress strain curve. Uh, 
which uh, are here. And here are some examples shown with dashed lines. So the predictions are, are these dashed lines. The actual true ones that you simulate using the model are the solid lines. And well, then there is some average for this data data set, some with some standard deviation. So, so you see that um, while the predictions certainly are not perfect, so they are not able to kind of resolve these fine details of the stress strain curves, so these individual steps or individual strain bursts, if you like, they still kind of follow the kind of general trend of, of, of each of these, these curves. So, so definitely the machines have learned something. They are not the the predictions are not perfect, but they, they are kind of decent at least. And uh, to kind of make this statement more quantitative, what we look at is, uh, is, is this kind of a quantity, which here we call S. It's actually the kind of the coefficient of determination. You could also call it R squared, uh, which is the uh, squared error of the, of the prediction in units of the, of the sample variance. Uh, with a minus sign and then you add, a plus, uh, add one. So, so that the perfect prediction where this prediction error is zero would, would give you an S equals one. S equals zero would mean that uh, you just predict that all, all your samples behave like the mean sample. So that's a very good, uh, very, very kind of crude prediction. Uh, we of course want to do better than that. Okay, so then you can just uh, look at this, uh, this prediction score S as a function of strain uh, of, of, of your of your simulation. Uh, so you see that first of all, for very small strains, you get very good predictions, which is kind of maybe expected because if you start from some configuration, uh, you only move a little bit some dislocation and you kind of know based on the initial configuration that, okay, well, what it will roughly speaking do. But then this goes down quite quickly um, to relatively low values. And then uh, at least for large enough systems, uh, it kind of starts to increase again and reaches some kind of a plateau for, for uh, large uh, strains. So there's this kind of a non-monotonic predictability, if you like. I mean, if you, if you take my word for it, that you can somehow quantify predictability of these systems by, the, um, uh, by how well these uh, machine learning models are able to uh, learn this mapping from the initial configuration of the stress strain curve, then uh, you could say, okay, the predictability somehow is, uh, is, uh, is non-monotonic as a function of strain. It's also uh, dependent on system size. So in this uh, larger strain regime, uh, larger systems end up being more predictable. We will get back to that, why that might be so. Then we also generate a different uh, database or data set to analyze, uh, which is what we call pre-deformed samples. So instead of just starting from this initial randomly generated uh, configurations that uh, we let relax and then apply stresses, we actually first apply stresses up to some, um, some strain or, or deform it up to some, uh, some strain uh, and then let it relax again. So, uh, and use those relaxed configurations as, as our kind of initial configurations for the, for the, for the simulation to actually look at. So here, uh, in this case, these samples have some deformation history. So they have undergone some, some deformation before the actual test that we do. And you see that, okay, this might have, this seems to have some kind of an effect. So, so the curves here are a lot bit different from those. So the, the deformation history seems to affect predictability in some, some way. Okay, um, yeah. So then you can, of course, try to, try to see how, how uh, dependent are, are these results uh, on, on this machine learning model that you applied. So of course, we, uh, we are physicists, we are not machine learning scientists. So we want to get some results that are not, uh, do not only reflect uh, the properties of a specific, specific machine learning model, but uh, some that reflects the actual physical system that we study. So here, uh, what I show is, is the, in the top row are, are the corresponding curves for the, uh, well, I, these are actually the curves that I just showed you on the previous slide. So, so the uh, score parameters of constraint for, for the neural network. But then we can do the same with the support vector machine and you can compare the, the, the curves. And I don't, I don't know, I mean, they are not exactly the same, but they are pretty similar, I would say. So, so somehow uh, the choice of the machine learning model here does not really seem to matter that much. It's more the physical system that you look at, I would say. Then, then you can, of course, I mean, here the problem, of course, is that uh, both of these models, uh, they use features as input that uh, we picked by hand. So it could be, of course, that the shapes of these curves, they, they, re they reflect I mean, maybe not the machine learning model, but they might reflect the specific set of features that we chose to describe the, the, the initial configuration with. And to test that, we can also uh, study the convolutional neural network, which of course uh, does not really require 
uh, feature engineering by the user so much because it just takes an image of the initial configuration as input and then does whatever it wants with that. So we can do that as well, and uh, we can compare with, for instance, the neural network. So, so here uh, you see, okay, so so these are not maybe perfect perfect agreement uh, with the CNN and, and the neural network, but the kind of the overall shape of the curve is similar. So, so you have this kind of a minimum, roughly in the same, with the same uh, strain, and then you kind of increase towards the end, and so on and so forth. And the same applies also for these predeformed samples. So here we kind of. Uh, Maybe convinced at least ourselves that uh, that uh, maybe the set of features that we we chose is not not the thing that actually determines what we get out of these things. Yeah, so then we can uh, try to understand why this uh, predictability curve looks like uh, looks the way it, it it does. Okay, so so um, you see that there is this uh, non-monotonic predictability versus uh, strain relation. So that. Uh, 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 we think is, is related to the um, onset of these uh, deformation avalanches. So you can look at um, the um, um, distribution of, of the st starting strains of these events, of these avalanche events. And it looks like this. So you have a kind of a peak here. So uh, at, at some intermediate strain, you will generate lots of avalanches typically. Then it will go down as you, as you, keep, as you keep increasing the strain because the avalanche actually be, get bigger and bigger. So there will be a smaller amount of them uh, per unit uh, strain. So, but um, but yeah. So the funny thing here is that this maximum of the of the number of events that are triggered uh, actually coincides with the minimum of this predictability. So so that um, yeah, because the idea is is that uh, because these avalanche events are are supposed to be like inherently predictable things. Uh, sorry, un unpredictable things. So if you, if you get lots of those, then it's kind of hard to predict, right? And that's why you would get this uh, minimum in your predictability. Um, yeah, so that would be that. Then you can also look at the, the, the size effect. Um, so, so one thing is, of course, that you have these avalanches there, which themselves exhibit a size effect. So as, as, as we kind of saw in the very, very first slides, uh, if you have a larger system, your stress strain curves tend to be more smooth, so the deformation avalanche are smaller. Um, and, and then this, this could also, this could make it somehow easier for the model to predict what actually happened. Because you have like your avalanches that are these stochastic, hard to predict events are kind of uh, uh, smaller. But then you can also look at the kind of linear correlations between the, uh, the, the stress, the given strain, and, and, and various features that we fed uh, to these uh, machine learning models. So you see that some of these features uh, also exhibit size dependence. So for instance, there is this uh, one feature that uh, is especially uh, important, which, which is the first Fourier coefficient of this uh, geometry dislocation density along y, which is the direction perpendicular to the dislocation motion. Um, so this is this kind of tells you if there's some imbalance in the y direction of uh, of the positive and negative dislocation, and, and then this seems to be a new informative predictor here or descriptor of the initial state, which also exhibits a size effect like this. So it becomes more important for larger systems. Um, yeah. So that kind of uh, maybe explains a little bit why there is the size effect. And then we can also look at the the effect of predeformation. So 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 here uh, the point is that uh, if you apply some stress, you deform your samples. You actually uh, induce some uh, structure formation in your in your uh, dislocation system. So so you which then shows up as more pronounced correlations of the dislocation. So you can look at the the uh, like the pair correlation function of the dislocation, and you see that okay, these become more pronounced as you apply some uh, initial deformation. So what, what this means is that uh, you have these uh, structures that become more kind of clear cut uh, after you, you have uh, applied some pre-deformation. And uh, that kind of, of course, it means that you have more clear cut features that also the machine models are able to use for prediction. So of course, if you would have like a completely random, like gas-like uh, featureless uh, initial state, then it's kind of difficult, I guess, to find anything that you could correlate with, uh, with uh, uh, stress strain response, but if there are like clear features, you say some structures that uh, you can clearly see if you look at the configuration, then it becomes also easier for the for the model to predict. And indeed, I mean, if we found that the predictability, especially for large strains where you have these structures formed already, uh, was better uh, for these predeformed samples where you have more structures. 
Okay, so that was um, all. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if I said very clearly, but uh, all of that had to do with uh, with a specific loading mode of, of your dislocation system. So, so you kind of quasi statically ramped up your stress, uh, and and, and uh, so it's it's like an infinitely slow deformation process, if you like. But here, uh, what we want to study is is how what is the role of uh, applying a finite strain rate. So your deformation now proceeds at some rate that you specify, and uh, then you can uh, study what happens to this predictability uh, as you change the rate. So how fast you, you deform your crystal. <laughs> so to do that, we take the same model as above, but now uh, instead of having a constant sig sig uh, external stress, we adjust uh, it according to this equation, where here is the uh, strain rate that you, you, you specify, I mean, the, the strain rate that the, with which you deform your sample. And this is the actual strain accumulated. And then there's some stiffness parameter K that kind of relate to it. You can think of it like this, that you have some kind of a spring with which you, let's say, uh, displace the stop part of your sample. So you um, impose some shear deformation, but you drive it with a spring. So, so you have some finite stiffness. Here. And uh, yeah, I mean, here, uh, what we did, but we, we, we tried three different machine learning models. So, so linear regression and uh, neural network. Uh, and those uh, use kind of similar features as, as, as before, but then we also use, uh, had a convolutional neural network. So like three different types of models, one linear model, one non-linear model, and one without any feature that does not require any, any feature engineering. And we now try to try to predict uh, the stress, stress at a given strain for different values of these driving parameters. So the strain rate and then this uh, stiffness, stiffness parameter. So for uh, for this specific study, what we did was we generated ten thousand uh, initial configuration to correspond to stress rate for each of these uh, uh, values of uh, the strain rate and the, the stiffness parameter. So here, I mean, uh, of course, you have like uh, some rate effects also in the deformation process. Just to mention here briefly, uh, which is which uh, means basically that if you if you uh, impose a very small strain rate, then your stress at a given strain tends to be uh, smaller than it is if you uh, impose a large uh, strain rate. So this blue blue curve has a, a two orders of magnitude larger strain rate than the red ones. Then you also have some sample to sample fluctuations here, which is actually what you're trying to predict. Right. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so 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 the way we uh, just to kind of go go through again this feature uh, extraction process. So you have this initial configuration that might look like this, and you can extract from these different fields. Uh, so here is, for instance, the dislocation density field. Here is the density of the the geometrically necessary dislocation density. So it's just the difference of the densities of the positive and negative dislocation, which are the blue and red guys here. And then you can also look at uh, the, the the internal stress field. So again, I mean, all of these dislocations produce this complicated long-range uh, uh, stress field around themselves. And if you sum some contributions, all of these dislocations to stress field, you get a field that looks like this. And then you can extract various features from these fields that are listed here. So, so for instance, uh, you get various Fourier components, you get uh, uh, some other statistical properties of these, these fields, which is then feed uh, into the input layer of the neural network again, and you try to predict the stress of the given strain. Um, yeah, then we also have the CNN, uh, where we use as input uh, the uh, uh, initial uh, an image of the Im initial dislocation configuration, which looks like this. So actually, what we do is we first uh, kind of uh, represent each dislocation with this kind of a Gaussian function um, to kind of make this uh, descriptor uh, independent of the resolution to some extent, because these are point particles. So of course, we don't. Uh, I want to describe this, them as like mathematical points, uh, but rather some kind of a more diffuse object. And then we, we choose a resolution uh, for, for this, this uh, J field here, um, which is actually in this case, uh, 128 by 128 pixels. And this is chosen because uh, that's a high enough resolution. So you can still resolve the individual dislocations as separate objects, but it's not too high to kind of uh, make your uh, CNN too complex because if you have a very, very, very high resolution of your image, then you actually need to make your CNN more complex and you need more training data. So this is a kind of a compromise to, to uh, still resolve the system, but not uh, use excessive resolution. 
So now uh, we, we can then look at again, uh, uh, basically the same quantity as before. Now, now we call it R squared, not S, but it's the same guy. So, <laughs> sorry for that. <clears throat> so, so here, uh, 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 each of these uh, small, uh, small sub figures here is for different uh, value of strain and different value of, uh, of, uh, of the stiffness parameter K. And then here we, uh, we, have, we show the uh, R squared as a function of the strain rate. So the general kind of conclusion here is that it seems that, um, uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the neural network and, and the linear regression, they always give rise to roughly speaking the same result. Uh, however, the CNN is able to do better than that. So it seems that uh, the CNN is able to extract some features from the initial configuration that we could not think of, which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure what exactly is this information that the, the CNN is able to extract from the initial configuration, but something there, it, there's something because with the same uh, data set, it's able to do better. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the key point here is that uh, for each of these cases, for, for all of these models, there's clear rate, rate dependence of this effect, especially, um, I mean, for, for small strains, so this top row here, you kind of have this monotonic increase of predictability as you increase the rate. So the, the larger your strain rate, the easier it is to predict the, the stress strain curve. Uh, this is also true for, let's say, this a little bit larger strain. However, here for, for the even larger strain, uh, you, and if your kind of driving spring is stiff enough, you get this kind of a non-monotonic behavior. So, so initially it goes down as you increase the rate, but then there's a minimum. And then for the very, high, very large strain rate, you again uh, improve the predictability. So yeah, now, now we try to, of course, make some sense out of, out of all of this. So, so why do we have these trends with the strain rate for the R squared? So, so the, the idea, first of all, is that um, we, we try to, um, because of course, I mean, if you, if you change the strain rate, uh, you change the nature of the dislocation dynamic. So for, so for very um, large strain rates, actually because of the size effect that, that, that I already showed you here, if you have a larger stra strain rate, then at a given strain, uh, your stress will be higher. And now there are two kinds of uh, uh, stresses in your system. So this external stress that we show here, and then the internal stresses that are roughly speaking constant. But now because of this rate effect, the, the external stress will become in relative terms more important for large strain rates, uh, which then uh, shows up as, I mean, here, what, what we do is we, we look at the, um, the fraction of dislocation that are moving in the, against the direction of the, the, the external st external imposed stress. I mean, of course, if, if, if all, the, all the dislocations would just move uh, in the direction that is set by the external stress, uh, then the dynamics would be kind of simple, right? I mean, you have just a bunch of dislocations that are all uh, responding in the same way to the external stress, basically. So the interactions between dislocations are not important. And this is basically what happened in the limit of a very high strain rate, because then the external stress is very large. And, and that dominates the dynamics. However, if you have a, a smaller strain rate, then the interactions between dislocations are very important. And actually what happens is these dislocations form this kind of a complex multiple structures, which kind of tend to drift slowly together uh, uh, as you apply stresses. And uh, yeah, these, these uh, structures contain both positive and negative dislocations. So, so they, uh, there are actually lots of dislocations that move against the direction set by the external stress when the strain rate is small. And what we can do here is that we can uh, measure this uh, fraction of dislocations moving against the external stress, so n minus divided by n, uh, as a function of strain uh, for different strain rates and uh, and uh, and uh, and these uh, stiffness parameters. So what we find is that for small strain, uh, sorry, small um, strains. Uh, we can actually correlate this R squared and, and the fraction of dislocations moving against the external stress, which we take to be kind of a measure of the complexity of the dislocation dynamics in such a way that if, if, you're, uh, if uh, almost none of the dislocations move against the external stress, which happens for large rates, then uh, the, uh, the R parameter or the predictability is, is, is good. However, if uh, a larger fraction of your dislocations move against the external stress, which typically happens for low strain rates, then uh, your uh, um, your uh, predictability is worse. So there's kind of a nice correlation between this correlation and the, the 
the fraction of these which is moving against the external stress. So we kind of argue that uh, these things are related. So 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 it's uh, easier to predict a predict dislocation dynamics when it's simple. So when it's uh, when the, each of the dislocations just uh, individually uh, responds to the external stress, but when it's more when the dynamic is more complex, then it's harder to predict. Okay. Uh, well, then we can also look at uh, this non-monotonic non uh, behavior uh, for for uh, for uh, large uh, large strains. So that's uh, we think is related to, to the uh, kind of a transition from smooth uh, deformation. Dy uh, sorry, from uh, fluctuating deformation dynamics to smooth deformation dynamics as you increase the strain rate. So for small strain rates, you have this typically this kind of fluctuating stress strain curves with some. Uh, uh, stress drops and uh, you know this kind of uh, dislocation avalanches in the background, while uh, for larger strain strain rates you get a smooth uh, stress strain curve, and there's kind of a transition between the two uh, as you increase the strain rate. And uh, the the point is that uh, there's a kind of a transition point where you typically have only of the order of one uh, such uh, uh, stress drop in your stress strain curve, but actually this individual stress strain uh, individual. Um, uh, stress drop is hard to predict. I mean, because it's basically one avalanche. So, so then uh, the stress strain curve is kind of uh, affected a lot by this individual event, which then shows up as a kind of a minimum of predictability around the onset of uh, around this transition from fluctuating to smooth behavior. I don't know if it makes sense, but uh, I think this this more or less works like that. Okay, so if, I don't know if, how much time I have, but I would have still one more story to tell you, uh, which is about this uh, dislocation pileup model, which is now, I mean, uh, up to this point, we, we have always looked at this 2D model where you have dislocations moving in, in this box, in this 2D box. Uh, but now uh, we, we simplify the description further. So we only look at the, like a one dimensional line uh, along which our dislocations can move sort of in a queue. So they are all of the same sign. Um, and uh, then there's some kind of uh, pinning potential where, where, where this kind of queue of dislocations are, are, are moving. Um, so you have like some, uh, some uh, random, randomly positioned pinning points which interact with the dislocation with this kind of a Gaussian potential. So this is a kind of a simple model of a dislocation pileup in some uh, uh, crystal which also has some, uh, some uh, additional defects like, I don't know, solute atoms or precipitates or something that interact with the dislocation, act as obstacles for, for dislocating motion. Yeah, so I mean, I mean here uh, we can uh, again also in the same way as before, we can uh, simulate this model. So integrate this uh, equation of motion numerically, we can uh, generate this kind of stress strain curves that look like this. So you again have this um, uh, avalanches of plastic deformation there. And uh, yeah, so, so different samples will again look, look a bit different because uh, each uh, sample will have a different realization of this uh, pinning energy landscape. And uh, yeah, so now we would like to understand what, what, can, what can we say about this system. So of course now uh, this uh, system is a bit different from the previous one in the sense that now we have a well-defined pinning uh, transition or critical point, uh, critical stress value at which we get the deepening transition between a uh, uh, pinned and moving states of this uh, of this dislocation system. And at, at this uh, transition point, the, the avalanche of strain burst size diverges. And uh, if, you, if you look at the system below this critical stress or force, if you like, and the avalanches uh, you can that you get, they, they have exhibit this kind of typical uh, scaling form where you have a power law up to some uh, cutoff that depends on the, on the stress level. So how close to the critical stress you are. So now the question is, can one predict the stress strain curves in this system? Uh, which kind of uh, exhibits a little bit different type of uh, avalanche dynamics as the previous previous systems. Uh, can we even perhaps say something about the, the individual avalanches or these individual, let's say, steps of the staircase like uh, stress strain curves that you get? Um, right, so, so now, uh, again, we have to say something about the features that we use. Uh, so so uh, here, what we ended up using is, because we, want, want, we need some kind of a descriptor of the, of the, of the pinning energy landscape, right? So the pinning force landscape. So, um, so what we do is we actually consider quantiles of distributions derived from the uh, sample specific pinning landscapes as features. And then, then we can also already look at, I mean, what, what happens if you, if, you, if you look at just the, the correlation with the flow stress, which is the stress uh, 
at which you start kind of an individual, uh, you start an infinite avalanche. So this is the critical critical stress. We call it the flow stress because then the system starts to flow indefinitely if you exceed that that stress value. Now we can try to predict that flow stress uh, by just looking at the, these various quantiles of the pinning energy landscape. So you see that uh, already the the um, five percent quantile of this uh, uh, of this. Uh, Pinning force landscape, it, it, it already is, 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 is a very good predictor. So you get a get a correlation of 0.8. It's actually minus 0.8 because um, um, if if this this guy has a um, uh, yeah, so so if, I mean if, if if this guy has a uh, small value, then you end up having uh, having a no, sorry, um, I got actually confused. Never mind. So, um, yeah. So then, uh, then you can look at uh, different uh, different models. So you can look at linear regression, uh, neural networks with different structures. You get this kind of a complex looking uh, correlation with the strain. Strain in that case. And then you can also look at uh, like what are the features that are actually matter. So there's a specific technique here in the, in the case of the linear regression, where you can look at the, the kind of penalties of this L, L1 regularization that we use. So, so if, if this, this, this has, a, has a significant value, then it's an important feature. So we can see that, okay, this, this pinning energy landscape and the derivative of the pinning force landscape, uh, they, they turned out to be the important. Ones. And then also the, the extreme of the of the pinning force landscape. They are they are important for large strains. So there are these kind of strain dependent on the importance of these different features. In this case, I mean it kind of makes sense. So so these these guys these guys kind of control the linear response of their system for small strains. While then uh, if you look at the, like small uh, large strains, so when the dislocations are moved a lot, then it becomes more important. What are the extreme values of your pinning landscape? Um, Right, so yeah, then we can also do, do CNN, so convolutional neural network. And what we now feed as input for the CNN are the, uh, the, the, the pinning energy field and uh, some sort of an indicator of where the dislocations are initially relaxed in the initially relaxed states, which again, we call the J field. Uh, so we have these, uh, these two, two fields, basically, that we, which, are, which are now one dimensional fields because this is one dimensional system. So you have some positions, which are uh, these peaks of this red curve of the dislocations initially, and then you have the spinning energy landscape here. Um, yeah, so then you can uh, do like two different thing, types of CNN here. So what you call a generalist and specialist CNN. So the generalist CNN tries to predict the entire stress strain curve at once. So it tries to figure out, I mean, output the entire stress strain curve. Uh, while the specialist uh, is trained uh, trained to, to learn a specific, uh, has the stress value corresponding to a specific, specific strain. So it's uh, like a special task rather than a kind of a general task of predicting the whole thing. And it seems that uh, the specialist CNN usually is, uh, is able to do better than the, than the generalist one. So here are some, uh, some, uh, some correlations. Uh, with the stress of the given strain as a function of strain of these different models. So you see that this uh, convolutional model where you do this individual prediction is actually very, very good initially, and uh, it always actually outperforms the other models. Um, yeah, and then you can also, yeah, fine tune the model even more. And let's say we put, if we focus on the, on the, on the uh, flow stress here, the last point here, uh, then uh, by uh, applying some regularization to this convolutional net network, we can actually improve this correlation even further. Then as a kind of a final thing, uh, um, I will briefly mention that we also tried to uh, predict <coughs> these individual <coughs> avalanches uh, for this specific system. So that, uh, of course, I argued before that this is kind of an inherent hard task to do. So if you have a like, critical avalanche, it doesn't really know how large it's going to be. So it should be difficult to predict. Um, so, so the way we, what, what we do here is we, we kind of um, uh, try to predict uh, something that we call an avalanche map. So, so here uh, is, is, uh, is, a, is a 2D kind of, a, let's say a heat map of uh, a span by stress 
and the avalanche size. And here is then, uh, let's say, the, uh, the uh, I mean, the, the color here indicates where did you get avalanches in the specific uh, realization of your system. So here are some examples. So you could like, could, could get like uh, something like this uh, or, or this. I mean, these are the actual uh, smoothed versions of the avalanche that you actually get in the given simulation. And then you try to teach a, a machine learning model to kind of infer the, uh, or, or predict this map, right? Because then you would predict the individual avalanches. And here are the predictions. Uh, so now, uh, okay, so this maybe look a little bit like this. So here is lots of yellow here. Maybe there's some yellow here as well and so on. But uh, it's kind of difficult to quantify this. How, how, how well, how well uh, does the prediction actually work? But what we can do is we can correlate these two. I mean, the, the, the target and the prediction. And uh, these are shown here. So these are actually for different system sizes. And, um, and, um, and what, what, what we get here is that uh, there's a large part of this map that is completely black, which means that the correlation between the target and prediction is, is zero. So there's no predictability. And that actually means that we are kind of in the power law part of the avalanche distribution where you actually have this truly critical avalanche that, uh, that uh, we cannot really predict. I mean, this is to be expected, kind of. But the funny thing is that there is also, there is some positive correlation here and here. Uh, which basically means that, means that avalanches in the cutoff uh, uh, generally are to some extent predictable. And uh, also, funnily, the avalanches very close to the flow stress, even if not in the cutoff, only, are also to some extent predictable. So this is a kind of funny thing, uh, which actually would be nice to understand better. But uh, but uh, it seems that uh, whenever you are not exactly at the power law part of your avalanche distribution, then you can predict at least something. So the largest events that you get at, at a given stress level, those you can predict with some accuracy. Not perfectly, but uh, a little bit. Okay. Um, I suppose that's it. So here, uh, I think I've already used all my time, so I'm not going to read through the summary. I'll leave it just here. And uh, thank you for your attention and thank uh, Finland for funding this, uh, this stuff. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to try to answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Scott. It's really informative. I do have several questions, but uh, is there anyone else? Uh, if you have questions, you can please type uh, in the Q and A part. Um, uh, meanwhile, I mean, I can I can start. Um, sure. So uh, the first question I think I have is uh, when you showed the variation of. Um, Yes, that is uh, some kind of score. And you said this mm -hmm. minimum is coinciding with the onset of avalanche. Uh, I did yeah, not- Yeah, this one here. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, why that is because the thing is, I mean, I, I thought that the machine learning algorithm would learn from the avalanches itself. So if, how is it that the maximum of Avalanche rate is where you uh, where, where the score is least. Uh, well, uh, it, it, I mean, the, the idea is that yeah, the, the idea is I mean, I guess I can show you also this one here. So here are basically the uh, the predicted stress strain curve, which are the dashed lines, and the real ones are the solid lines. So you can see that uh, the the model is not really able to resolve the individual events. Right. I mean, the, the, let's say here we have a one one stress uh, one one strain increment. Then you have a stress increment, another strain uh, avalanche. But I mean, the, the dashed line kind of follows the overall curve, but it doesn't resolve the individual events. And this is kind of a, one way of seeing that uh, okay, th these individual events are actually hard to predict. And now that the point is that uh, um, that here, what we what we measure here is the um, kind of uh, density of avalanche onset as a function of strain. So if you here at the maximum, you kind of, uh, uh, tend to generate, start lots of, lots of avalanches. And because these are hard to predict, we have lots of them, then it's also hard to, hard to predict the overall uh, stress uh, value at that strain. That's the argument. I don't know if it actually is true, but at least we have a very convincing correlation between the position of this uh, maximum here and the minimum here. Yeah, that, that is very clear. That is 
And that is actually what the second part is that uh, the predicted line, of course, you just showed in the, uh, in the answer to the question that it doesn't exactly give you the uh, strain jumps, but does it at least give, or I mean, if, if you have measured the size distribution of it, I mean, does it give the, the, the uh, scale-free distribution as the original jumps do? So if you if you no, I mean uh, we haven't actually. I mean we haven't actually looked at the the uh, uh, let's say the avalanche statistics from this predicted stress strain curve because I, I as you see from here I, I think it would be something completely different. So it, it cannot really predict those. So so it, it doesn't have any information of the distribution or anything like that. So so I, I don't think it will work. Would work. Okay. And then this this is at the end it is it is a flow. Uh, Right, I mean, at the end when the for large strain value, it is it's like there is a flow onset of flow. Yes, uh, in this last model, so where you have this deepening transition, so so you have this uh, kind of a one-dimensional dislocation pileup interacting with some quench disorder, yeah. and if you if if there you increase the stress beyond the the critical stress, then you just keep flowing indefinitely. It doesn't really happen in the, in the 2D system because there you will get some st structure formation. So the dynamics is not stationary in the sense that you, you will uh, form more and more complex structure as you, as you uh, accumulate more and more strain. So uh, yeah, you don't really have that. But here in this case, where you have this uh, 1D simple model with disorder, quench disorder, there you have this uh, onset to flow. So at the, I mean, is it possible to predict the point where it starts flowing or onset of flow? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Indeed. So, so that's one of the things we did. So, so let me let me try to show you. Uh, so, so here, for instance, I mean, th these are the predictions for for different models uh, of the stress at a given strain for different strain. So now the prediction of the flow stress is basically what happens here at the large strain. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, most of these models they, they give a correlation of 0 0.8 something. If you fine tune your model uh, very carefully, you can get up to like 0 0.9. Uh, correlation of the flow stress uh, using the information from the initial configuration. Okay. Okay, there is something else. Ah, so, so there's a question about explainability of, uh, of yeah, the machine learning yeah. model. <laughs> right. So, okay. So, yeah, so, so so by explainability, I guess you could mean that uh, if you if you if you understand what are the features that are actually responsible for the for the um, yeah. for the result. So so of course for the CNN we don't really have it. Uh, it's a black box to us. I mean I don't know. Maybe there are te techniques that you can use to actually explain what the CNN has learned. Uh, I'm not an expert, so I don't know. But uh, for 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 the um, let me show you well for instance i mean here uh we can look at what are the kind of important features in the case of the pileup model um so you but when you use linear regression or, or or the simple neural network you can say that, okay the uh, initially it, it, what is important is the is the pinning energy landscape and the derivative of the force uh, of the uh, force landscape and then for larger larger uh, strains what we got important is uh, the uh, uh, pin force or the extreme of the pin force landscape. So that's one, one example of uh, what we can kind of uh, look at the individual features and see what their role is, roughly speaking. Um, then we can also go back to the 2D case, I think. So for instance here, uh, I mean, we just look at the, the uh, uh, individual uh, features, how they are correlated with the stress of the given strain here for different system sizes. Um, yeah, so you have some information, but uh, I mean, it, uh, we haven't really looked too much into, I mean, how to actually explain uh, uh, what the machine learning models when you combine, what the machine learning models actually do when you combine all these features. I mean, these are just linear correlations of these individual features. So, I mean, I, I know that there was probably a talk this morning about this, this very yeah, issue, but I wasn't there, so. <laughs> there was, and uh, the speaker there also mentioned that uh, these more accurate models like uh, neural network are 
uh, I mean, less, less explainable um, as opposed to other models which are perhaps less accurate, but more explainable. So there is a, there mm -hmm. is a yeah. of yeah, yeah. these two. So that is, that is precisely uh, what uh, was discussed there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it would be very nice and useful, I think, to kind of uh, see more into the models, uh, machine learning models, and, and see what they actually learn, so that we could also learn something. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. exactly. So yeah. And yeah, feature importance, I think, gives some idea, of course. That, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a kind of a simple thing that you can do. But then beyond that, I'm not... Uh, yeah. Actually, I, I, I don't know what is the kind of state of the art regarding the, that. Uh, would, would have been in, in, interesting to see the talk, but unfortunately, I was probably still sleeping. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's a huge time, time gap. Between, yeah. So, um, yeah, but you can still have, I think, the recording, you can still uh, have a look at. Okay, cool. Um, any other question? Comments? Okay. Um, if not, then uh, let's thank uh, Professor Lars Larsson again for this wonderful talk. And thank you um, very much. hope to have uh, many more future interactions, especially. Oh, I, I just found out that. Uh, I mean, our university, uh, we thought was a very new university. It's, it's slightly older than yours, it turns out. Ours started <laughs> cool. in 2017, so, mm -hmm. yeah, um, but yeah, anyway. So but what, was it really, uh, is it like a completely new university or some sort of a merger of like all older uh, universities? It's not a merger, it's more of uh, this SRM university existed uh, uh, long before, but uh, this campus was, uh, this. This university is known, but the SRM group of universities exists, but uh, this one uh, is new. So it wasn't, uh, yeah, your, in, in, in your case, I think this is the merger, as you said, of several uh, existing universities. Yeah, yeah, so these are kind of old universities that merged. Uh, that, that merged to form. Yeah, yeah, so it's a kind of a general trend. I mean, Finland used to have lots of like small universities scattered around the country, but now, and somehow there's a pressure to merge them into, into bigger units. Alto is the same as this. Alto was also a merger of, of uh, different universities, yes. Yeah. But it's been now uh, operating for more than 10 years already as Alto. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, Amit? Uh, uh, yeah, Amit. thank you. Yeah, maybe uh, I would like to thank to all the speakers. Uh, we have got four speakers, uh, uh, Professor Bindit, Dr. Nidish, and Dr. Sanmai, and Professor Larson. All have given wonderful talks, so thank all of you. And uh, I'd also like to thank our SRM administration, especially uh, ITKM people. Without their help, we could not have done this uh, for technical support. It's wonderful. Thank you all of you. Our HOD, Professor Thapa, uh, his constant encouragement also helps us to make this kind of events in regular interval. And I would also like to mention uh, the overwhelming response that I've received from the participants. Thank you all. Uh, we really look forward to have you again. And uh, we, of course, have planned to make such events in regularly. So hopefully, We'll meet very soon, sometime uh, next year. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to close this meeting. Thank you all. And Merry Christmas in advance. And also Happy New Year in advance. Take care, everyone. Thank OK? You. Yeah, thank you. Bye, Bye Lassa. OK, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Sir, shall I end the session, sir? Yes, please. Okay. There is something uh, people are asking about uh, perseverance certificate and all that. But that we yes, yes. So we will issue perseverance certificate to all of you. So don't worry, we will receive some email. And uh, also, uh, based on your feedback, we will also send you the certificates. You will receive some notifications soon. Feedback link. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Yeah.